All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here. And this is BXGS Weekly, episode 54, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. We've got, well, we got some stuff today here. Not that much, actually, for whatever reason. I'm not sure what's going on with the world. Maybe some JavaScript conferences. I think there's quite a bunch of them this month. Uh, but we do have some very interesting things today. So let's get started. Uh, hey, up here. Welcome to the stream. All right, the first article we got here today is called Diving into the Great Observer Pattern in JavaScript. This is essentially a very basic introduction to the observer pattern. If you already know what the observer pattern is and how it works and how to implement it yourself, you won't really find anything new here. If you are not familiar with it uh, and, you know, if you want to learn on how to build observers, how the subscribe and notify works and so on and so forth, then this is a really good starting article that will guide you through well, basically everything you need to know with regards to observers and a bit, you know, related to the DOM specifically. So there you go. Next article we got here is from the blog of Eddie Osmani, uh, who works for Google and is generally a very good uh, speaker and blogger. And he's now he's um, now he has his own personal blog. I think a lot of people started moving away from Medium due to all the pop ups and garbage that they have right now. So the article here is called rendering large lists with react window. And this is essentially a tutorial for a react window, which is a nice tiny abstraction library over react virtualized that allows you to window content as in, you know, windowing in a manner of you have a viewport and you only render whatever is seen in that viewport, not like everything that is available essentially, right? So it goes through um, introducing the virtualization, how it works, and why is it good, right? So for example, here's a nice chart that basically compares the rendering of a list of 10,000 items that will takes, you know, it's, it's very slow initial render, it's sluggish scrolling, it takes about 242 milliseconds to render into the DOM and it, it's a lot of memory, right? Uh, when we're talking about rendering the exact same list, but virtu with virtualization, you get 2.4 millisecond rendering just because you render the visible items, right? You don't render everything else. This is exactly how the lists, by the way, work on the mobile devices due to the limitations of the mobile phones, which makes them incredibly fast and efficient. So yeah, and then you get like 60 FPS, really fast initial render, minimal rows and DOM and everything works really nice. And the rest of the article is essentially the tutorial on how to use the uh, React window to render lists or grids of items that you want to scroll in different ways. So uh, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It's a very good article. Next thing we got here is use Redux state management pattern with React hooks. This is... Um, how do I put it? Basically, re-implement your own Redux using React hooks and uh, basic providers and use, um, what was it? Use reducer, I think that, yes, use reducer hook to specifically do it. Of course, it's not gonna replicate all the features of Redux, it's not aiming to do that, but you can actually replace the Redux in quite a lot of very basic apps with just this code here. So it guides you through every step that you would need to go through uh, to build a state global state management for your app using the hooks. And if you already kind of have understanding of how to do this, you won't really find anything super new here, like it's, it's a very basic tutorial. But if you are just getting into hooks and if you don't understand how the context works, if you don't understand how the user reducer hooks work, um, then check it out. This will give you a very good understanding of how to basically get started with it. Next article we got here is form validation using custom React hooks. Or more precisely, I would call it how to build a use form hook that would allow you to validate the values and um, sort of do it in a ubiquitous way, let's maybe put it this way, right? So the idea is that you're gonna build a use form hook that includes the some sort of a local state as well as the set of errors and a callback that should be used once the validation is done. And then you can just reuse that hook anywhere in the form uh, which that you wanna be validated essentially, right? So it's, it's quite straightforward. There is nothing super mm, tricky about that. It's it's all very, very simple. But again, if you are just getting started with the React hooks and if you still don't understand some points or maybe you wanted to validate the forms and have a ubiquitous hook that you can move from one place to another, this is a pretty good starting point, so do check it out. 
Next thing we got here is hooks, state closure and user reducer. This is an article that talks about uh, specifically about this use reducer hooks and how to use it instead of use state and when to use it instead of use state to make your code simpler. On an example of uh, using a basic WebSocket connection uh, and parsing the incoming messages by type and doing something on the clients to actually change the display, right? So it, it's a pretty decent write up. Uh, again, if you already know how the hooks work, if you already know how to use use reducer hook and why and when it might be useful, you won't find anything new here. But if you are just getting into the hooks and you are still confused about use reducer and think it might be complex, then do check it out. This has a very good description of it. Hey, Kevin, welcome to the stream. All right, next article we got here is from Dan Abramov's blog Overreacted. The article is called A Complete Guide to Use Effect. And as you can see here, it is a very complete guide, right? It's, I don't know, it's it's very long. It's, yeah, it says 50 minutes read. It is incredibly big and it addresses just about anything you ever wanted to know about the use effect hook. So if you have any concerns, if you have any questions, if you still don't understand some of the aspects of a use effect hook in React, um, there is even FAQ section in this article, just have a look at this and you will know everything you have to know about use effect. And yeah, it is it is incredibly detailed. And I think it you can probably even use that as a reference when you're writing um, use effects related things because there is, so much information packed in this post. Anyway, if you're using React and using hooks, do check it out. It's a very good guide. Next thing we got here is a picture is worth a thousand words, faces and barco barcodes, the shape detection API. Now that that's a thing I did not know existed until I actually saw that um, article. So here's the thing. Um, turns out the Chrome is adding shape detection API. It is going to be available um, from the Chrome browser, right? So I, I don't think it's actually standardized, which is a bit of an um, annoying part, but you know, whatever. Uh, for now, it's not important. The cool thing is that basically, if you it's behind the flag still, and you can you need to enable the experimental web platform features in Chrome. But once you do that, uh, the Chrome actually gives you API that allows you to detect faces, detect barcodes, and detect text, as in do text recognition using the web platform. Like you don't even have to set up any machine learning or whatever. You can literally just call a basic face detector API and you will get whether the face are detected or not within the uh, media, right? Uh, media, in this case, uh, you get the um, standard, um, what was it called? Get user media, I think API, right? Yes, get user media. So be it photo picker or camera or whatever, and you can actually just use the, um, yeah, you can detect faces with one line of code without TensorFlow.js or anything like that with everything basically embedded into the platform, which is just mind blowing. So if that sounds interesting, do check this article out. It gives you some code samples and guides you through how to use it as well as outlining the future work needed to uh, sort of done before shipping it. Um, yeah, but this is really, really awesome. Hey, Mandaputra, welcome to the stream. All right, continuing, we got uh, KV storage, the web's first built in module, another article from the Chrome dev team or Google web team, I guess. Now, uh, we've talked about the um, ECMAScript proposal that are, I, I don't remember, it's like a few months ago, I think, maybe even, yeah, in December, probably even before that. So there's a um, TC39 proposal to have a standard library in JavaScript, right? It is currently stage one, there's still a lot of work going on, but it's a really great idea. And we're finally seeing the first module that is a part of that JavaScript standard library. And this module is KV storage. It's essentially mimics the local storage API. You get the same uh, get set and delete and keys and values and entries. So pretty, pretty simple. Uh, but, you know, local storage API is known to be relatively slow and there's some overhead related to it and it's synchronous. So you can get like thread locking if you work with large objects, which is not nice. Well, KV, um, KV storage is asynchronous and allows you to do things without locking the main thread, which is nice. And it's also way, way faster than local storage. So this is sort of the main points that it addresses. 
It works is a very simple way. You can literally import storage from uh, STD colon KV storage. So this is how the standard modules is going to be prefixed now. So it is an ES6 module and you have to use it as a module. Um, as far as I understood, it won't work uh, any other way right now. And uh, yeah, it's actually seems to be really cool. You can polyfill it. So there's already a polyfill if you want to. Uh, try it out right now and um, yeah this is this is really exciting so we got the first module uh, for the uh, built-in module standard library is expanding and uh, if that sounds interesting do check out the article there is more information uh, code samples and all that kind of stuff looks relatively straightforward in the usage and uh, yes can't wait for this to be shipped to the production I guess I'm also very curious to see what other modules we're going to get in standard library all right, next article we got here is an introduction to web Bluetooth. Uh, we already had a bunch of them. So um, yeah, I'm like, I'm not sure this is basically an introduction to web Bluetooth, right? So there's nothing super special about it. I mean, it seems like my, for some reason, I'm not displaying some things. I'm not sure what's going is it I, that blocker doesn't even seem to block anything in here. What is going on with my page? The new metrics doesn't showing me something that yeah, there we go. So I guess it blocked something. But yeah, there we go. Okay, now it works. Right. So it's a very basic introduction to web Bluetooth API it sort of walks you through how to set it up, how to connect the devices, how to interact with them. We had a bunch of articles like this. So there's nothing super special here. But uh, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Uh, will that be a part of Node.js too? I'm guessing yes. Like the thing is that this is sort of supposed to be standard library for JavaScript, right? This is what the proposal says. So it would be weird if they say it's going to be a, a standard library for JavaScript, but it's only going to be available on the web. So it doesn't make sense. I hope they will bring it to Node.js at some point as well. But um, what that would mean actually is that would, it's probably not going to be part of VAJS as in the engine, right? So it probably means that the Node.js would either have to backport it from Chrome or other browsers, or they would have to re-implement it themselves. So um, it's probably going to mean that the Node.js will be lacking, uh, sorry, sorry, lagging behind in schedule, or unless they have some other way to sort of upstream it from the um, Chrome, right? So we're, we're going to see how that develops. I'm hoping they would do that in Node.js as well, because that would be really cool. Like having a proper standard library, as I already mentioned more than once, I think is a really, really cool thing. But okay, continuing, we got GraphQL in depth, what, why, and how. Uh, another very long article, uh, this time around from uh, Ponyfu, who, uh, well, R Ryan Glover, uh, who has um, amazing blogs in like 90% of time, basically, and... Yeah, this one just walks you through the GraphQL, starting from the very basics, um, showing what problems does GraphQL addresses, how it improves uh, REST, how does it work, how do you write queries, how do you build the backend. So basically everything you ever wanted to know about GraphQL to get started is here. If you already know how the GraphQL works and why do you need it, there's nothing really super new here. So we won't find anything um, important, I guess. Right. Next article we got here is Node.js and Express Tutorial, Building and Securing RESTful APIs. Again, another basic tutorial that uh, guides you through building RESTful APIs using Express, Mongo, um, Passport, whatever. There's like a bunch of technologies that are typically used here. If you ever built Express uh, REST uh, backend, you probably know all of that stuff. Uh, if not, then well, there's some good st uh, starting point here. Um, this is, as usual, a blog from Auth0 team, which means that you're going to be using Auth0 package at one point to secure the API because they are typically doing this with their blog posts. They are, you know, pushing their stuff, which is totally fine. Just keep that in mind. All right. Next thing we got here is Iodide, an experimental tool for scientific communication and collaboration on the web. Now, this one is really awesome. So this is an open source tool from uh, Mozilla team that allows you to do or aims to allow you to do an um, data science entirely in your browser. And there's like a bunch of, well, different examples here. Um, yes, mom, please not, not, not blocking, no, no blocking for this stuff. Um, now what is happening here? So I allowed that, is it ad lock preventing something? No, what is, is it broken? I guess last time I tried it, it actually worked. So I'm not sure. There we go. Okay, this one works. So it actually allows you to write um, 
like I wouldn't compare it to LaTeX, but it's sort of a weird mix of JavaScript, Markdown, and well, just basically everything, including, I think it even allows you to write Python in some places to uh, build those documents, right? That are not just interactive, but also very, very rich. As in, you know, you can literally write JavaScript functions here and invoke them. And the cool thing is that they are pl planning to have those cores, which is very similar to um, the um, currently, like probably the most popular data science tool, which I totally forgot the name. Python, wait a second, data science. Um, what was the name of it? God damn it. Oh, um, right. Let me just think for a second. Uh, interactive. I am an idiot. I completely forgot the name of the most popular tool and the tool that I've been using for the past several years. What was the name of it? God damn it. <laughs> All right, uh, tools. I know that it is somewhere here. It should be somewhere in the top. NumPy, yes, SciPy. Was it? No, 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 SciPy. Pandas, you got the, what do you call it? Oh, come on. Come on, it's gotta be somewhere around here, right? If anyone in the chat knows the name for this thing, please tell me because this is driving me nuts right now. Google Trends, no, this is not scrappy, no. Um, uh, what is the Python notebooks? Scikit pattern, come on, it's gotta be somewhere here. SciPy, no, that is not it. That is not it. Python interactive, interactive notebook. Was it Jupyter? God damn it! This is what is it. So there's the Jupyter, right? The Jupyter notebook. On its own, it is incredibly powerful tool. It is very useful. It also has the support for different cores, so you can actually use the code from different languages, and it including JavaScript and you know even compiled languages like C sharp, F sharp, whatever. And there is this uh, observable um, observable HQ, I think, right? Um, that sort of aims to do this. This is from the author of D3GS. And it sort of aims to do the same thing, but for JavaScript and just purely the browser side. So there's some very cool visualizations here. There's some really cool notebooks and it sort of allows you to code right in a browser and then reuse those modules. It's a really cool idea. Now we have a new thing that is called iodide from the Mozilla that sort of aims to be, I guess, the Jupyter of JavaScript because you know it's built in Node.js and JavaScript and primarily uses WebAssembly for a bunch of stuff. And uh, it seems like they are intending to extend it with other languages because they are like introducing the Pyodide here that adds the Python support to it, which is, Kind of awesome. And it's not just Python support as in, you know, hey, you can write Python code, but it actually allows you to use stuff like uh, matplotlib, which literally, if you see the screen right now, it allows you to plot the 3D graphs and rotate them right in the browser, which is freaking mind blowing, to be honest. So I am quite excited to see where that goes. If that sounds interesting, if you're working in data science or well, really any data visualization, make sure to check out the blog post, make sure to check out the tool itself. And uh, if you are interested, there is a GitHub repo here where you can contribute. And if you note, it's basically 81% uh, JavaScript. So it is kind of awesome. Why is JavaScript so unpopular for data science? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't call it unpopular, but I would say that just Python is more popular because there is more stuff for it. Um, I can tell you one reason. So in JavaScript up until now, you did not have any you know, proper way of working with very large numbers. We did get big in like half a year ago. And Python had uh, stuff like uh, Scikit and NumPy for ages, right? So you, have, you already have a tools for working with numbers where statistics and majority of time you already have all the uh, formulas and algorithms that you can uh, need in the process so you don't have to write them yourself essentially. So it just comes down to the ecosystem. I'm guessing we're gonna see a shift towards JavaScript in the next five years or so, but yeah, for now, Python is gonna be dominating just because the ecosystem is larger. All right, that's my take at least on it, you know.
All right, <clears throat> continuing, we got building a GraphQL server with Node.js and Express. Another tutorial, uh, this one is sort of GraphQL again, but more hands-on. So if you now know from the previous article on what GraphQL is, why do you need it and how does it work? Well, this one will teach you how to build a um, GraphQL server using Express. It's a very basic tutorial, just shows you the very, very basics. But it will get you started with Express and GraphQL quite easily. So if you ever wanted to do that, do check it out. If you already know how to do that, well, there's nothing really super complex in here. All right, next thing we got here is styling in React Native, exploring the best ways to style a React Native application. This is essentially a survey of all the possible methods to style in React Native, starting from the style props, going to the spread uh, style sheets and going to the styled components and ending with an SVGs and styling like this. So it's just a nice summary of the ways that you can style things in React Native. If you already know all of that, well, there's nothing really new here for you. All right, next thing we got here is update on experimental features in Node.js. This is sort of a write up on uh, ever evolving Node.js core and uh, experimental features that it currently has and the most important, I guess, experimental features that are gonna be releasing soon-ish and outlook on, you know, the actually a reminder that some of those features might get deprecated. There is actually a surprisingly large list of deprecated features in Node.js if you're interested here. But uh, specifically, the article talks about the uh, most relevant experimental features in the moment that are worker threads, performance hooks, diagnostic report policies, and ECMAScript modules. This, I guess this is the most interesting for a majority of people. So if you are interested in those features, do check them out. I also thought the worker threads were no longer experimental. Um, no, they are still experimental. Okay, so I guess they are without a flag, but still considered experimental. Got it. So if you're curious, do check it out. There are some interesting write-ups with on you know with a bit of code on how to use those features, what do they do, and why do you want to use them, and also when uh, might the changes happen, basically. Next article we got here is when Zoe not equal Zoe, or why do you need to normalize Unicode strings? I also have no idea how to read this thing because this is not a German letter and I this is definitely an umlaut, right? At least the Germans call it this way, but I have no idea how to read that. Like this, this is a Russian letter actually, but this does make any sense because it, it's, you know, okay, whatever. I'm just not gonna talk about it. So this article talks about a Unicode normalization and why it is important to do it because there is a lot of letters that look very similar, but actually from different languages and it can be impossible to compare if you compare them by bytes, right? Because they are different Unicode characters and will always result in false. So if you're working with the uh, Unicode strings, make sure to check this out. There are some very interesting thoughts in here. If you are never have, if you never had to deal with that, I would also recommend you reading through this. Uh, it's not a big article, but there's some very interesting insights into the Unicode strings and uh, working with them in terms of comparison and string matching. All right. Continuing, we got supporting old browsers without hurting everyone. Um, now this talks about setting up the webpack to build for multiple targets uh, and ship those multiple bundles to the different uh, users by sort of using different approaches to this in the browser, right? So this sounded like a complete bullshit, but I hope you get what I mean, right? So the idea is that you just build a different browser. Oh, God, God damn it, let me try this again. The idea is very simple. You build different bundles of JavaScript code for different browsers, right? So you got the modern bundle, you got the older bundle, and you got the bundle for Internet Explorer 8 if you have to support it. God help you, but yes, the idea is that you can quite easily do that with a single Webpack config by just setting additional, adding some minor tweaks to it and changing the config for minimizer, for uh, polyfills and so on and so forth. So if you have to support multiple browsers and you wanna minimize the amount of code you are shipping, do check this out. It uh, gives you a pretty good uh, starting point. All right, ne now we are actually going into the small uh, things uh, area, where do we have like uh, tips, awesome bits and all that kind of stuff. The first thing we got here is another article from uh, Google Web Developers team. Uh, it's called Move Ya or maybe Don't if user prefers reduced motion. It talks about uh, one of the accessibility settings that is called prefers reduced motion. That basically says that, uh, you know, some of the users don't want things to move on the web. And um, the article talks specifically about what does it mean? What does this 
Uh, why does this feature exist? Because, you know, some people um, get motion sick very quickly from even the slightest movements on the screen. And uh, how do you actually account for that feature, right? Uh, so it's interesting that you could do that in uh, both JavaScript and uh, CSS. So make sure to read that through if you want to be accessible, which is always a good idea. Right, next thing we got here is a blog post from a Chromium team, which is called Chromium File Reader Vulnerability Fix. And there was a CVE in uh, Chromium and Electron that was uh, fixed quite recently. So if you are using, um, if you are building something with Electron, make sure to upgrade as soon as you can. The article contains the versions that are uh, basically free from the CVE. So if you, again, if you are using uh, Electron, make sure to check it out and upgrade as soon as you can. So that is your app are no longer uh, vulnerable, basically. All right, next thing we got here is CSS Working Group approved CSS Nest. Ne <laughs> I just had to screw it up. Let's try again. CSS Working Group approved CSS Nesting, which now has early working draft in stage one. So yes, the CSS nesting, which has been there for ages in languages like Less, SAS, and you know, 25 other ones. Uh, is now coming officially to the CSS itself and it's really awesome. So like I cannot wait to write the CSS this way because it's just way more convenient, right? Continuing, we got seven tricks with resting and spreading JavaScript objects, a nice collection of neat tricks that you can do with rest spreads. Like for example, excluding properties from the objects is probably my uh, favorite one where you can take a property that you don't need, take the rest and then just return the rest, right? So this will leave that property out and it's a very handy shortcut to essentially throwing out stuff of the objects that you know you want need. Um, there's a bunch of others, so make sure to read through that because there are some really good ones. Next thing we got here is, we are the React Native team, ask us anything on Reddit. So there's a pretty big post where a whole React Native team, which is relatively large as you can see here, answers questions from the people on Reddit. So if you are using React Native, make sure to check it out. There is some really cool stuff in there. Next thing we got here is an announcement that Amazon Web Services joined the GraphQL Foundation, which is kind of mind blowing. I did not expect that to happen, but there you go. So GraphQL is basically increasingly gaining the popularity and now Amazon is also going behind it essentially, which is, yes, it seems like GraphQL has a pretty bright future. Next thing we got here is a new feature coming to the bundlers and to the browsers, a way to load the uh, modules by uh, syntax. So we already had the way to uh, load the no module code like the classic bundle JavaScript, right? And we have the type module, which is only works in the browsers that basically support that. Uh, but that was always limited to a specific, so you, you anyway had to transpile it if you wanna use newer features, right? So now they wanna introduce additional syntax that would allow you to provide modules that have newer syntax. Say you wanna provide the module with the current syntax, this is actually redundant, but you also wanna provide a module that has the syntax from 2018 and it's gonna be split by year so you can actually you know, just nicely bundle your JavaScript and say, hey, this, this is actually features from 2018, 2019 and so on and so forth. And each of those bundles will obviously be smaller and smaller, which is kind of awesome idea. And uh, yes, it is kind of cool. So um, there is, I don't know if there's a link in the discussion, but there's already like GitHub uh, issue open in TC39. They're already discussing this. So I'm guessing we're gonna see this either, you know, in some form uh, sooner or later um, shipped to the Chrome, I guess, behind the flag first. But yeah, this is kind of cool. Right, continuing, we got three topics in one JavaScript interview question. Now this one is kind of awesome. You might have noticed that I rarely post those kind of articles that talk about JavaScript interview questions because majority of time they're kind of, you know, very artificial, very bullshit, and doesn't really bring a lot to the table. Now this one is very different. Now here's the code it has. So there's a for, for loop with a var increasing from zero to three, right? And inside of this for loop, you have a set timeout with one second that just console logs i. It's a very simple code, right? And uh, there is two questions. What will be logged when it executes? And how do you fix it to log it from zero to one to two, right? So very simple. If you already know the answer, well, congratulations, you have a pretty good understanding of JavaScript. 
If this confuses you, the article explains it very well as to what happens, how does it work, and how do you fix it. So if you are, again, if you don't understand how this code works, make sure to look at the description, look at the article, and read through it because it's a very good description. And it's actually a really, really good question to ask in the interviews because it immediately shows the understanding of JavaScript in like, yeah, literally three lines of code, four, okay. There you go. All right, continuing, we got Chrome light pages for a faster linear loading experience. So yes, Chrome team, um, specifically for Android uh, data saver, introduces a new way to load pages through the Google uh, servers that would suppose to increase the um, loading times for very, very slow connections like 2G or slow 2G which is, yeah, I don't think I've, I've used that connection in ages, but I know that, you know, in some parts of the world, that's still sort of a norm. But uh, yeah, it is a bit interesting because it seems like all the data that you are going to be requesting are going to go through the Google servers, and this is exactly where they're going to optimize it. So I'm going to be uh, interesting to see how this experiment ends up and what exactly, how, it, how exactly is it going to affect the pages? Right, next thing we got here is JITless V8. So V8 version 7.4 now supports JavaScript execution without allocating executable memory at runtime. Now what that means is you can now run V8 in some platforms and environments that were not possible to run it before, right? So there are some environments and some platforms that literally prohibit the right access to executable, let me try this again prohibit the right access to executable memory for non-privileged applications, right? So you literally cannot run V8 there with the current model. Now 7.4 actually has a special flag to allow it to run without doing that. So you can actually now run it on stuff like smart TVs, gaming consoles, and most importantly, iOS. So it might be that in years future, we would actually see uh, Google Chrome running on iOS with the proper V8 engine. And what's even more exciting, I would be very interested to compare the performances of it. So uh, running in the JITless mode obviously degrades the performance. There is um, comparison here below in the chart. And you can see that, yes, the baseline is quite significantly faster, especially for the benchmarks like speedometer and web tooling benchmark. Like speedometer is like super slow, uh, so just less than 25% and compared to the 100% being the baseline. And um, they, Dev team says that they will improve performance over time, obviously, as usual, but the JITless mode is indeed way slower. But it will be still interesting to compare how it works on iOS and how much better it performs than the JSC there. It might actually be worse, but I'm very interested. And if it performs better, the new React Native architecture would actually allow us to swap the GSC for JITless V8, which is even more uh, exciting. So there you go. If you're interested in it, I am terrible today. Let's try this again. If you are interested in the details, make sure to check out the post itself. There is some additional stuff in here. All right. Next thing we got here is why you shouldn't use Moment.js. Uh, this is a nice write up on uh, sort of comparison of Moment.js to other existing JavaScript date libraries and why Moment.js might not be the good fit for you. There is comparison in terms of size, speed, and so on and so forth. So if you're working with dates a lot, make sure to check this out and maybe pick a better library essentially. I would say Moment.js is quite severely outdated right now um, as in, you know, in terms of, well, everything. So there are better, um, <laughs> let me try this again. There are better alternatives out there and this posts outline uh, them quite nicely. Right, next thing we got here is introducing Firefox Send, providing a free file transfers while keeping your personal information private. A new open source server, uh, serve, open source service from Mozilla that allows you to share files, large files uh, in one easy step and share them uh, you know, with uh, encryption, which is kind of awesome. Again, you know, primary reason for why I am actually sharing this on the podcast is because the whole thing is open source and available on GitHub and written in JavaScript. So if you are interested in how this works or want to roll your own copy, just check it out. Uh, it is Node.js and JavaScript all the way with a tiny bit of Kotlin and Swift and uh, shell and Docker file, which, you know, Kotlin and Swift sounds interesting. So I <laughs> have not had time to dive into it, but there you go. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It looks pretty cool. Next thing we got here is Microsoft Open Source's Accessibility Insights, a special tool for assessing accessibility for the web. 
And yeah, it looks really cool. If you are working with accessibility, make sure to check it out. It is now open source and available to everyone and seems to be quite damn helpful. Next thing we got here is the fact that Node.js Foundation and JavaScript Foundation are merging to form the Open JavaScript Foundation, or I guess OpenJS Foundation would be a more precise, which is the name of it. So yes, um, they decided to merge and have one foundation for everything JavaScript, which I guess makes sense. Let's see how that develops. Right, uh, here's an interesting fact from the Lori Voss, the, uh, I think he's a CEO or she, no, he is a CEO of the NPM JS, right? And um, here's the thing, a major international bank accidentally published a private package of their own to public NPM registry. It took them three years to notice it and then send a DMCA tag down to Amazon and Cloudflare for hosting quote unquote stolen code. Now they have to pay a, so they as an NPM have to pay a lawyer to explain this to them, <laughs> which is, so just, just think about this for a second, right? Major bank published a private package on a public registry and didn't notice this for three years, which is insane on its own. And now they're blaming the Amazon Cloudflare and NPM for that, which is like <laughs> total bunkers. But this is how enterprise works majority of time. So yeah, there's additional thoughts in the thread and some very funny discussions there. So if you're curious to check it out. All right, last thing we got here for today is uh, the diff new podcast from Facebook open source team. Uh, if you are into podcasts, make sure to check it out. I believe there is no episode as of yet, but um, oh no, there are there are three episodes here. Okay, I'm just uh, looking at the wrong things, right? So if you're interested in the podcasting about technology and if you're curious about the internal workings of the Facebook open source team, do check it out. Seems to be pretty cool. It's the podcast itself is also available pretty much everywhere. Right, that is it for the uh, news and articles. And now we're coming to the releases section. The first major release of this week is React Native 0.59, which brings React hooks and updated GSC, which means performance gains and 64-bit support on Android, which is awesome. It also brings uh, faster app launches by using inline requires, as well as the Lin core, which is still underway, not completed, but essentially they are splitting off the optional features like async storage, image store, masked view, iOS, net info, sliders, and web page review, uh, view pager Android, sorry, and so on and so forth into their own separate packages that you can use if you need them which would make your resulting app even smaller, which is an awesome initiative and I totally like it. So uh, yes, if you're using React Native, this is kind of awesome, do check it out. Next release we got here is Chrome 73 with a major highlight being the progressive web apps work everywhere on Mac, Windows, Chrome, Linux, and you know, basically you can just have install prompts, install your web apps as a desktop apps, open them in a separate window and so on and so forth. It is really cool. If you want to see the other changes, do make sure to check out the change log. But yes, Chrome keep getting better and better. Next thing we got here is Billboard JS version 1.8.0. This is a library that is built on top of D3.js and allows you to easily do visualizations on the web. Um, basically, yeah, new features, uh, minor improvements, and so on and so forth. So if you are doing a lot of visualizations and don't want to spend too much time with D3.js, check out Billboard, it might save you some time. All right, I think the last release we have for today is Atom 1.35 that fixes that uh, vulnerability in uh, Electron and uh, adds some minor changes like uh, commit details and pull request diffs. And uh, I already said it more than once, but Atom for some reason has the most boring release notes ever, especially after VS Code. But <laughs> You know, there you go. If you're using Atom, be sure to update just to get this vulnerability fixed, basically. All right, now we're coming to the libraries and demos section. And the first library we got here today is really uh, our arm, arm, I don't know how to pronounce this. It's a resource manager, okay? It's called RMGR. And it basically allows you to release resources gracefully. Uh, the idea is very simple. Once you, um, you basically add a resource with an instantiate function that does something like, for example, connects to MongoDB. And a second argument is a function that disposes of it gracefully, right? Like for example, MongoDB connection close. You can add multiple resources and then once you want them to finish, you just uh, close the resource manager and that's basically it. 
There is a lot of funny names in NPM. Yes, Mandaputra indeed. There is insane amount of ridiculous names in NPM and it's just gonna get worse over time, right? So at some point people are gonna run out of names and we're just gonna get random bullshit. <laughs> this is how naming works essentially. All right. Um, um, right, okay, let me just close this, there we go. Next thing we got here is avif.js, um, avif polyfill for the browser. So this is a polyfill for the AV1 still image file format, which is kind of insane. And uh, yes, it literally polyfills the image format and you can literally load these images in the browser without actually having support for that browser, which is <laughs> kind of awesome. So there you go. Right, next thing we got here is React Native Pixel Catcher, a library for UI snapshot testing for React Native. And by UI snapshot testing, it means that it literally captures the screenshots of the UI and then compares them pixel by pixels and tells you if something broke or changed or, you know, I mean, this is how the snapshot testing works, right? Does this for uh, React Native, which is kind of impressive. So yeah, there you go. If you ever wanted to do this, you can now do this with this library. Next thing we got here is iBolit, lightweight web components library built with lit elements. And it's essentially a bunch of um, web components built on top of different frameworks like Bootstrap, Bulimo Material, White Label, and so on and so forth. There is a demo available in Storybook. All of them look pretty cool. Like yeah, it's literally Bulimo components. There's literally the um, uh, material components and all of that is web components and easily reusable in your app uh, without any additional frameworks, which is kind of awesome. All right. Next thing we got here is Promise Utils, a Lodash like dependency free utilities for native ES6 promises. <clears throat> Apologies. So essentially just as the title says, it's like Lodash, but for promises, uh, there is a docs available. There is some ABS, like it's not as expensive as Lodash as you might imagine is just released, but uh, might be nice for some cases. Next thing we got here is GraphQL to Chart.js, instant real-time charts using GraphQL. So this is the um, another project from the Hasura team, which is super impressive, uh, zero config, um, GraphQL based tools for Postgres essentially. And this one expands on top of Hasura and allows you to literally just write a query and get a super nice real-time chart from your backend, which is just mind blowing. So if you ever want to do something like this, do check it out. It seems to be quite cool. Next thing we got here is Lax with three X at the end, simple and lightweight, two kilobyte minified and zipped vanilla JavaScript plugin to create smooth and beautiful animations when you scroll. Now the demo looks damn impressive. Just look at this. This is very, very slick and all of that in just two kilobytes. So if you ever want to do some scrolling animations, make sure to check it out. This seems to be very cool. All right, this is actually it for the libraries and demos. Now we have some silly stuff to close this thing off. And the first thing I want to highlight today is called Thanos JS and is a library project, I guess, tool that will reduce the file size of your project down to 50%. And as you might guess from the name, it will do that by randomly deleting the half of the files of the project, <laughs> which is just perfect. So if you ever wanted to delete half of your project but didn't couldn't decide which half, well, Thanos JS can help you. It's also available on um, well, basically everywhere, and and the command is Thanos snap fingers, which is just perfect. And to install it, you have to gem install power reality mind space time and soul. It uses Ruby gems because of course it is just a, I think <laughs> perfect programming joke about Thanos. So there you go. Right, next thing we got here is chaos, turn copied code into chaotic mess. It's a tool, uh, speaking about Unicode, it's a tool that takes all the semicolons in code and replaces them with a Greek question mark that looks very close to the semicolon, almost identical essentially. And while it looks fine for humans, obviously it was gonna fail all the code compilation and parsing, right? Uh, so yes, if you want to mess with someone's code, you can just run this thing and then break everything basically. There you go. Right, uh, next thing we got here is um, a tweet from Tim Berners-Lee that was, I think the tweet was on yeah March 12th. And that is exactly when we had the 30th birthday of World Wide Web. So just think about it. World Wide Web as we know it is just 30 years old. It is mind blowing. It is so young, but yet so advanced and so insane and keeps developing with 
incredible velocity. I'm, like, I'm really excited to see where it's going to be in like 20 more years, or even 10 more years. But there you go. All right. And the last thing we got here before we close this off is called stack RoboFlow or this question doesn't exist. It is, um, yes, uh, TensorFlow based stack RoboFlow question generation, uh, including answers and all the other bullshit. And it is pretty damn hilarious. So if you ever wanted random questions from Stack Overflow, do, do check it out. It is kind of amusing. All right, that is it from my side. This was BXJS Weekly, episode 54. Uh, you can, as always, find all that stuff on bxjs.dev. Uh, the link is in the description to the channel, to the podcast, or whatever you're watching this. All this stuff is available on GitHub. And uh, yeah, that's basically it from my side. If you guys have any questions, suggestions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If not, uh, or you're watching this later, feel free to join our Discord server to discuss it there. And uh, yes, um, that's basically it from my side. Doesn't seem like we have any questions or suggestions. So thank you guys very much for watching. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you're watching this later. And I see you next time. Bye.